Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're uh, here for our review session this Saturday afternoon, and I appreciate Jose, Mark, and Yunan uh, uh, being here, but I'm also recording this because a lot of other of our fellow classmates cannot uh, attend today. So the purpose of this review is to just give uh, some a little bit extra time uh, for our remaining casework in this class as we hit into the last week of our spring session for this corporate finance class. One of the difficult things of, of going in the, uh, into our new calendar that began a, a year or so ago is the eight week sessions is to try to cover all the material necessary for you to need as an NBA student to get the full value from your program. And so it is a little bit of a struggle and is putting a lot of pressure on students to complete uh, all the ta all the assessments, but I think uh, this class especially is doing a very good job in meeting the demands of the course and and getting things done and doing very well at the same time. So, what I'm going to be doing today is for the, about the <clears throat> first 15 or 20 minutes of this review is just going over the paper format and the paper part of this assessment. What I will be <clears throat> expecting as as the paper or the interpretations of the case. I think we've covered pretty much all of the uh, spreadsheet uh, details and especially in my uh, review, uh, my weekend uh, update video as of yesterday. I don't know if all of you have seen that video, but going over some other, some more things about that spreadsheet. So this morning or this afternoon, we're going to concentrate a little bit on uh, the paper and then I'll open it up to the, the students uh, in attendance here. Any specific questions you have about the case, uh, including the spreadsheet uh, that you might have that I can go over and answer as the best that I can, uh, uh, and not give too much away uh, as, as any of your questions you have. And then also, if you have any questions about the case number three PowerPoint uh, that you all are finishing up this weekend and posting on Monday. So that will leave it open for question and answers after we are done. So I am recording this uh, review session uh, for those members of our class who cannot uh, make it and even for the members of, of you who are here so you can review it uh, a little bit later. So let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, if there's uh, no other infrastructure problems, I see we're all online and as we are typical MBA students and coming out of the Zoom age, you don't have your cameras on, but uh, that's not being requested of me. So you don't have to put your cameras on. This is a review session. If this was a remote class, yes, cameras on, but do not worry about having cameras on for this review session. So let's take a look at the paper. So let me bring up a few things here. Okay, as indicated in uh, the course assessment case, uh, this is a company, Electrics Incorporated, which is now uh, is considering an expansion of its current product line to include an electric motor, motor conversion kit. Customers can use these kits to convert their cars from gas to electric drive systems. The CEO of the company is a guy named William Livingston. And Mr. Livingston feels that due to high energy prices, anybody buy a, buy a gallon of gas these days, consumers will be more, more willing to consider purchasing these conversion kits to convert their cars to electric. Clever idea. So your job in this case is to uh, help Mr. Livingston and the electrics are incorporated to tell them whether this is a good idea or not. And what do we mean in finance that it's a good idea? Is it going to maximize shareholder value? Are you going to return a significant amount of income or profit margin or return on investment to warrant this new product line, which there's two options due to the makeup of the controller uh, that converts the electric motor or the car to gas, to electric. So that's your job is to look at all the requirements, both in regards to the nature of, is this a good idea? Is this a sound idea? What's the market tell us about all this? And secondly, financially, is this return on investment worth the while? 
uh, and uh, you're going to be doing a capital budget analysis and a series of steps that we have outlined in the last couple of weeks. So that's the case. The key part of the paper is after you review the analysis and after you do the analysis in the spreadsheet version of this is to answer a, a series of issues and questions to report to Mr. Livingston about this plan, this strategy. Question number one. Uh, before I get into that, I do not want your paper to be a series of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is not a memorandum. This is a paper. This is a technically a financial research paper in APA format. So the answers to the questions should flow through the paper. This is not, again, a memorandum. This is a paper reviewing, and in your paper and in your writing, you will be answering these variety of questions throughout the paper, all right? In regards to the format of the paper and all that, I'll save that for a little bit. So we are to answer these eight questions in our research paper. How much importance should be given to the energy cost situation? which the energy cost situation is the driving force behind this new strategy by the Electrics Incorporated. This would require the MBA student to probably give a one or two page assessment of what the current energy situation is in the market of Electrics Incorporated. The market of Electrics Incorporated is Southern California. So I would expect uh, one of the reasons why they're doing this is for the high energy costs, the high dollar costs of gallons of gasoline, and maybe a review of assessment over the last few years of why we're in this situation and how much consumers have to pay, which is warranting Mr. Livingston to make this strategic plan to convert, have the ability to sell a product that converts gas-driven cars in Southern California to electric. So an, a review of the marketing or the review of the qualitative, qualitative angle of this, of this question. In other words, why are they doing this? What are the specifics or somewhat give us some, some details of why would electrics want to do this? So the student who gives me a one paragraph saying, well, gas prices is high and that's why they should do it, that ain't going to be enough. I want to see some type of analytical situation of why, where are gasoline prices? What have they been doing for the last couple of years in Southern California? And why would they make a drastic $17 million decision to invest in this product line to, to take advantage of that market? So that's question number one. Then question 20, number two is involved in determining the cost of capital of this company. What is the project's cost of equity and what is the project's cost of debt? In other words, as of today, when you're doing this analysis for the Electrics Incorporated, what are their various costs based on the information given to you on, of the cost of their money? And then explain is the weighted average cost of capital the appropriate discount factor to use in evaluating this project? Could other costs be used in the analysis? I'm gonna help you a little bit out, out with this question because it's a little ambiguous, but it's not that difficult. Then you explain what the weighted average cost. Once you have the cost of their money in equity or in debt as of today, then you use the weighted average cost to come up with your cost of capital based on the capital structure desired by this company to be maintained maximum value of their business, the debt to equity relationship of 1.5. That's how you determine that. And is that an appropriate discount factor? Explain what the weighted average cost of capital does for you in giving you a discount factor, looking at the discounted cash flows of an analysis. Why is that helpful? What other costs could be used in the analysis? Well, you could use the inflation rate. Use the inflation rate as your discount factor. If the company is heavily equity financed, use the current prime lending rate. Based on the company's credit rating, their prime lending rate plus a certain amount of points, what would be the cost of capital if you decided to invest or get a loan for, by based on the prime interest rate today's market? 
those are two other alternatives to cost to be used as a discount rate in this factor. Not only the weighted average cost of capital, you could use the inflation rate, you could use the, dis the prime interest rate plus whatever points there are for the company's credit rating. And there's numerous others. I wanna see a few other alternatives that you could use in this analysis. I'm not asking that you use them, but that you use, could use in this analysis. Then question number four, which of the two controllers should be used in the conversion kits if you decide to go ahead with the project and why? Well, here is where you go to your analysis, your capital budget analysis, your risk analysis, all the information that you have gathered, what controller would could you decide to be used? Now, in this question, you also can say, Mr. Hassey, I don't think they should use any of the two product versions or the two controllers because I don't think the return is high enough to warrant that return on invest to warrant the return on investment that I interpret the Electrics Incorporated needs to properly go forward with this. You could do it that way. Or you could just say, I like this controller, I like this controller, or I like both controllers give me a decent return. And we have an option we can use. I recommend you can use to both of them. Then we get into question five. Use the appropriate capital budgeting techniques to evaluate this project. And that's when you go in and briefly, you might want to put in a chart or a, a table showing the results of the two methods. Don't show me the entire spreadsheet in the paper. Show samples of what you determined. You can refer to the appendix and the tab in your spreadsheet document. Do not do not include the entire spreadsheets crunched into your paper. I'm going to take a lot of points away if I see that. You're referring to the spreadsheet as appendixes, as tabs, or you insert charts or graphs that highlight the analysis of capital budgeting. Then you look at question six, and I've talked about this in our review weekend update video of yesterday, Friday. Using the uh, average demand scenario, the base case, evaluate the sensitivity of the project's NV MPV with respect to the price of the electric motor and the cost of the controller. So there's two variables, not three like in case number two, two and you use the appropriate deviations of plus or minus 10, 20, or 30. Question seven, and that question six, will evaluate in writing what that sensitivity analysis tells you. Question seven, based on the scenario and sensitivity analysis you performed above, comment on the overall risk of the company. So when you, you're commenting on specifically on sensitivity or sensitivity analysis in question six, but then in question seven, looking at the overall risk of the company, taking into account the scenario analysis, which is a delta or change of sales per year based on the probability that those, those deltas will occur. And also again, reviewing the sensitivity analysis. Then you get into your final question, which basically reverts back to the original abstract of your case paper, is what you're trying to find out. And here's the recommendation or the conclusion of that. Would you recommend the electrics accept or reject the, pro the project? What is the basis for your recommendation? I do not want a sentence saying, oh, I pick CTX controller. That's what I think it has the greatest return, it has the greatest IRR, it has the greatest numbers. It fits into our what we like to do. I need details. Why you're thinking that way? Why, why using the information given to you, why are you coming to these conclusions? And that's the paper. Then you give me the spreadsheet with the various tabs as the appendix so to I can review and relate to your paper. I want to be able to read in the paper what your analysis is all about in the spreadsheet. So that's the questions that I want answered and what I expect from them in this paper. It's not a review, it's an interpretation. 
it's not one or two paragraph conclusions. It's a analysis of strategic decision making. And that's what I'm looking at. Now let's take a look at the sample paper that I have provided. Now, the sample is a paper somewhat similar to the electrics case, but this is a APA paper at the undergraduate level, not at the MBA level. The format, the presentation is similar to what I expect, but the details, if you're reading this paper and say, oh, I'm going to put that in or I'm going to put that in, that's a big mistake. Don't pull anything off this sample. The sample is there to give you a sample of the format, not on what I expect the writing or the presentation to be. So remember that, please. So you have in an APA research paper, you have the title page, which gives the name of your company, the electrics, my name, the course name, University of Laverne, and the date that you're submitting this work, which in all likelihood would be May 28th, 2023. Then you get in what is called the abstract. Remember the abstract of a research financial analysis paper is to give what the paper is all about, what you're trying to do and where you're going to. Note the last uh, line of this paper or the, of this abstract. The paper outlines assumptions and calculation methods used to find the cost of capital, discount factor, cash flows over the life of the project, investment criteria, NPV, IRR, profitability index, index and payback, based on the NPV, the IR, the profitability index, payback calculations, the assumption that the engine is, is hybrid, electronic, or alternative clean fuel, and I'm going to say that's, do not put that in, the engine will be electric, and the assumption that the warranty program has an excellent customer service, I recommend this product. So right up front in the paper, you're telling me your conclusion. Then you're going about showing me how you came up with that information. And that's what your paper is about. Have the abstract and the title page on the two different pieces of, of sheets of paper. Don't forget to include a page numbers. And notice the paper starts off right about What's the energy cost situation? That's the first question and goes in and tells us a little bit about the energy cost situation. Then it goes into the analysis. You can even have these headings if you like, but all the questions one through eight will be answered in this flow. Notice it's not a memorandum. It's a series of information, a series of charts, a series of information to tell you, notice don't use this. This is another type of, uh, analysis, but it gives you an idea what charts are good. And then you get into your recommendation, how you came about it, and so on. Remember, this is uh, about a 10 page paper, including everything. Outside consultations, you know, if you if you talk to Mr. Hasse about certain topics, if you've asked individuals in your in, that you know, that's an outside cult consultation. And then you have your references. So if you go to people and ask them for information or for help, that, that's an outside consultation. You're asking somebody. If you go and look at data that you look up, that would be in the references area. So I want them designated. If you talk to maybe your boss, who's the controller of your company, and they've done these analysis, or they've created these project reviews, and ask them for some opinions on that. If you ask Professor Hasse for a perception of how to do something or a review, that's an outside consultant consultation. 
But if you go and get specific data from the internet, where did you get it? That would be in the reference section. Very important that you designate between the two here at the graduate level. That's what research is all about. So the people reading the paper, in this case, Mr. Livingston and myself, know exactly what, you're, what this document is all about, what you're trying to do in this document, your analysis of the various questions asked of you in this analysis, and then where did you get the thinking, the analysis, the information from actual people and specific internet or reference sources? That's the paper. And you will be graded on the quality of your interpretation. You'll be graded on the quality of your writing and grammar and presentation. You'll be graded on the quality of your assessment and be able to understand and use the variables given to a proper analysis of the information. That's how I grade this work. Okay. That's a good brief outline of what I'm expecting on the paper. It took me about 15, 20 minutes, that's about right. Now, the only last thing I'm going to do is highlight what I talked about in the Friday video of yesterday, making sure you understand, and let me bring this up. Because this is where most people go from A work to B work. They do, not, they do not put the format in a professional financial making decision model that goes step by step and clean transition of data so I can interpret it and you can interpret it into your writing. And that's what I mean by setting up your spreadsheet into nine tabs. I know this is in somewhat a pain in the ass, but this is how research and financial statement analysis are done in the real world. Having a disciplined approach to data management data review, and then interpreting that in a nice, consistent review document, your paper. Nine tabs, not 10, not 15, not three, nine tabs, each with a specific point of reference of data that refers to your overall analysis and recommendation for this product. That's important. So the format of the paper, the presentation, of the paper, the information or the interpretation and the quality of the interpretation in reference to the spreadsheet information that is broken down by tabs. And these are the tabs. You've done all of these in review in class and case number two. The only difference, as I mentioned on Friday, was a couple of the specifics of the variables and how best to attack those as an MBA student. So those are important points to note as you prepare your final work for this paper over the next week. Remember, if you need extra time and are having you know, issues with time management, get the extension on quiz or on case number three. But you could because you cannot get an extension on this electrics case. All work needs to be submitted by Sunday. If, it, if you submit your work past midnight on Sunday, it will be rejected. So take the time to prepare for that when it's due. If, you, if you're in a rush with case three because you've been working on some of this stuff for the electrics case, get the extension on, on case three and post Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. But you cannot do that with the electrics case after May 28th. That's, that's one of the issues. Okay, so there we have it. That's my spiel uh, for the electrics case in this review heading into our last week eight. Again, and I've had many of our students do this. If you wanna send me a draft of your spreadsheet for me to review and point you in the right direction, bring it on. And I will review it and send you back that information. 
I beg your, I beg sometimes I'm a little bit late, maybe a day late in getting back to you. I promise I will not be that this week because my schedule is a little bit lighter this week for the end of the session. So I will get back to you immediately within the hour if you send me your draft. But I will not review any drafts of the paper. So don't send me that. Uh, or if you do, I won't. I'll just say, I'm sorry, I cannot review the draft. I'll only review the drafts of the analytical side of this case. So gentlemen who are in attendance today, there you have it. I now open up the floor for specific questions about this case, about the paper, about the analysis, and even about case number three, if you have any. The floor is yours. Yunan, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Hasi. So first of all, thank you very much for everything you're doing, actually. You made this class so simple and easy by <laughs> all of those things you're posting, actually. Thank you, Yunan. Uh, I have a few questions here for the sure. paper, for questions seven and eight. Uh, sorry, okay. seven, sorry. So questions six and seven on the paper uh, is kind of similar. So shall I in question six, is it acceptable if we put if I put the graph for the sensitivity and kind of uh, maybe another graph for the scenario? That's perfect, you know, that's, that's fine. That in question number seven, so I don't have to like double right. it, you know? That's fine. Okay. That's excellent, that's excellent. Yeah, yeah, that is, you know, I didn't write this case. This case was written by our department, our finance department as a requirement of accreditation for the university. And this is what we have, you know, similar versions of this case throughout uh, the last, over the years. So we can uh, get accredited for our MBA program and everybody thinks we're, we're doing good. So it, this has been modified over time and has been adjusted or not, or tweaked. And we're constantly tweaking it, but this version that you know, what you're doing there is probably the preferred way of doing it. And I agree with it. Okay. Now the other question about calculating the warranty cost and the warranty in the schedule of warranty. So, <laughs> is it okay in the schedule to to make the whole tab of the warranty schedule per unit, and then in the average analysis we multiply that by the quantity, or you need to see the total? No, nope, that is the correct way of doing it, Yunan. Put it your tab for warranty should be your per unit cost, okay. uh, and then that per unit goes into your variables in your spread in your analysis and that and that per unit is multiplied by in your average case analysis 40,500 units exactly right now about uh implanting the inflation for our calculation so what i understood so far i'm doing the inflation only for the five years because i'm going to discount that five-year cost but that's where I'm applying the inflation but eventually from year one to year eight it will be the exact same number as a cost of warranty and the inflation only applied for the five years while we're uh, calculating it based on the discount rate we're choosing, right? Exactly right. Because remember this analysis is a little bit different and I mentioned this in my video yesterday. The labor cost per unit is 4,250. The parts per unit is 2,500. The price of the controller for 13 is 28, 1280. MT78-1260. Those are per unit costs that are going to be inflated every year one through eight. But the warranty cost is for a specific time period of five years. That's why you need to have a separate line for it because you're just gonna calculate five years of costs. And in those five years, two year two, three, four, and five are gonna be inflated because we are assuming the warranty will increase by the inflation rate in those periods. And then that core analysis will be discounted to one number and that number stays the same every year one through eight. Okay, sounds great. Okay, good questions, Yunan. That's good because a lot of people are struggling with that. Why do you and why I understand you're inflating the labor parts and all that because we did that in case number two and that makes sense. But the, again, the warranty cost is a whole no, another animal, a whole another way of analyze analysis, and that's why it's treated differently. And that's why I encourage a student to set up a separate line for that to keep it separate and it makes it easier to calculate. Very good. Thank you, Yonan. Thank you. Mr. Mark, Jose, Shabby, any questions or you want to just, are you just kind of listening and seeing what's happening and 
as we go along. I, that's there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but do you have any specific questions? Actually, you answered my question with Yunnan. I have the same one as far as the warranty. Yeah, but, good. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I okay, don't good. believe I have anything else. Okay. I think um, one of the things that will occur is that as you start putting these final numbers together, and, and again, I stress you, if you're doing a draft, do, do the CTX 13 first. Do the average analysis, do the weighted cost of capital, do that first. And then if you want to send it to me, I'll review it and say, yep, you're right on it. Your warranty calculation is right on. You're doing this fine. Now finish it up, Do finish the scenario, finish the sensitivity. And now you got the template to do MT78. And so that's the best way of attacking this because I can't tell you how many students in the past send me the entire spreadsheet of both products and they did something wrong in one of those areas and they got to go all the way back and figure that all out again. Better to know that you're thinking the right way, the pattern, and then go forward as you move forward. That saves a lot of time and a lot of less stress in your work. I got, uh, I got Shabby, do you want me to explain the risk-free rate? I got your chat. I'll just go ahead and do that. Maybe he signed off. The risk-free rate is given in the problem here as the current 10-year treasury note yield to maturity, which is 3.45%. I think in our definition of the risk-free rate, we use in our class and many classes, but this interpretation is different in businesses and in a lot of different analytical areas in finance. But generally speaking, the 10-year United States Treasury yield, whatever that yield is on the 10-year security, is currently is called the risk-free interest rate. In this case, in this problem, your risk-free rate is 3.45%. And Shabby chatted me. So that, so yes, Shabby, that is uh, what that means. Your risk-free rate to use in your cost of capital problem your cost of equity problem is 3.45%. That's the risk-free rate that you use going, putting into the capital asset pricing model formula to determine your cost of equity. If you may remember in the case number two was a little bit different. And in your original uh, case number one, when you did the risk analysis of your company, uh, that was also the risk-free rate was a little bit different given that problem. And it does, it changes. If anybody follows the Wall Street Journal or the market, the risk-free interest rate or the 10-year treasury yield changes daily due to market factors and market risk daily. But we're putting our a stake in the ground on this case, and that's the rate you'll use in your analysis. Hope that helps, Shabby. While we're on this page of exhibit three and four, the initial investment is $17 million. In case number two, the initial investment in year zero was 700,000. So this is a, quite a bit higher. And uh, in year one is when you begin your selling and expense calculations of your analysis. Going through year eight, this is an eight year project with a weighted at with a wor working capital of 10% of sales and no salvage value. There's no salvage value to worry about in this problem. You're just going to fully depreciate the $17 million by the marginal accelerated cost recovery system. Now, that is a, an IRS format calculation. Confuses a lot of students because it's based on a seven-year asset class, but it depreciates that over eight years. So that what that's what you'll be using as your analysis, the eight year depreciation calculations and how you know that if you total up each eight years, it totals to 100%. So you'll be allocating the $17 million over eight years depreciation of your project. Remember depreciation is an expense to determine that income and also is it a, a, a added cash back, cash flow back to determine net project cash flow, you add back in depreciation in your analysis. 
So you're, you're fully depreciating $17 million over the eight years based on the percentages of the eight-year MACRS table. And there's no salvage value, so I don't have to worry about messing with after tax or after tax gain on the disposal of the equipment. There's none of that in this problem. Silence is golden. I'm doing my job correctly which sometimes I do not, self-criticism there. The less the questions, I assume everybody's pretty well got this. But I am, I am well aware that in the next week, week eight, I'll be available on Tuesday evening at six o'clock. Let me, let me make sure of my calendar here. I always say that and then something always pops up. Let's get my calendar out here. Yes, I'll be available Tuesday evening, 6 to 8, and Thursday evening, 6 to 8. Open Zoom for any questions. Also, if you want to send me your draft as early as possible in the week, that's advisable. Don't wait to next Saturday and Sunday to all of a sudden send your drafts of your spreadsheets, because really next Saturday and Sunday, you should be working on the paper. The numbers should be all completed. So that's just a word of advice to, for time management. Uh, Dr. Hashi, I have a quick question. That's yes, sir. Of the case number three, actually, but I was saving. Go that. ahead. Yeah, that's fine. So I know I submitted it already. I know I don't know if oh. I write anything, but I know that was like a quick uh, email between you and me about. Yes. I'm pulling from the financial statement and balance sheet for the company I chose. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem, or not the problem, the challenge I faced was basically because. We're working on March quarterly for yes. like sometimes it has all the information I need. Sometimes when we talk about like total sales or total revenue, it's not going to show the total revenue for the full year where I will do my math. It will show the total revenue only for quarters. So just confirming I did that calculation, but eventually when I compare it to the industry average, I try to divide also that industry average by four just to get some kind of numbers to compare. Yeah. I purposely did that, Yunan, to drive you guys nuts for that case. Okay. Because, yeah, because yes, quarterly information is, is difficult to get as far, as far as industry average and analytical. As I told some students, what you did, Yunan, is fine. But also what I told some students, and I didn't tell you this uh, because uh, I want uh, you, your idea and you're, you were doing it fine, but you can go ahead and find maybe the leading competitor of the company. So let's say you have Ford and you get the quarterly information for 23 and 22. And then the industry average, I, I am having a difficult time, difficult time getting that. Then why don't you just go to General Motors and get their comparable information for those quarters from General Motors? and include that in your analysis. Because again, the the industry average is your leading competitors. Here, you can get around that a little bit by just selecting one of their key competitors and using that as the industry average. I don't have a problem with that. But Yonan, your method as in doing that is fine. So that there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, I did that with one of my average because- Okay, I, good, good. I'm working on Coca-Cola and I yeah. take PepsiCo. As, That's as, good. There's nothing wrong with that because they they pretty well corner the market anyway. So the, the the two of them comparable is pretty close to industry average anyway. So that is okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Shabby. Hello, Professor Hassi. Thank you Hi. for your efforts. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I have another question regarding uh, case number three. Uh, I already submitted as well. I was wondering uh, regarding tax rate there were two uh, rates. Uh, one of them uh, was quarterly and the other one was in 10, 10K and uh, those were completely different. I, I just uh, picked that one uh, from the quarterly tax. I was what, wondering what, if that's- what, what company do you have again, Shabby? Refresh uh, my memory. Home Depot. Home Depot. And that is exactly right. That's fine to do it. That's the way to do it, Shabby. Okay, okay. You're Thank fine. you very much. And uh, one other question, and I already asked you, uh, should we send the draft 
through email or uh, we need to submit in Blackboard? It's better to send email uh, because okay. I'm going to be doing a little traveling or I'm going to be like on the road or visiting mm -hmm. other offices. And so if I get email, I can directly look at it through my cell phone or through my iPad. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, the best way is to send an email. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, how long it takes to uh, submit the grace for case number three for you? Well, when you put like right now, uh, this afternoon and e after we're done with this review session, I'm going to start grading for those okay. case threes that have been already submitted and getting mm. those grades up by tomorrow. And then I'll keep grading those as soon as I can, because I want to make sure that all case three. Now, I do have some students taking extensions until Wednesday or Thursday of next week. So that means I won't post. I really don't can't post any solutions because it's all interpretation by the company. But uh, I will get back uh, as soon as you post. I will try to process ASAP to get those grades to you, so you see where you stand heading into your final week. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, Shabby. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I like about case number three, the PowerPoint, especially if I was a student, is I don't have to get in front of a class and go through this. All you're doing is submitting the file, so you don't have to get up and you know get in front of a class and walk through it and explain it and have the pressure of speaking to a group. Where all you all you're doing here is just showing me the uh, the information in a in a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and again, I can't stress enough the uh, more precise and and um, easy to read or the easy to read of your slides makes a big difference in your grade. Now, yes, you can try to pack in a lot of data, but due to the nature of this case, you really don't need to. You just provide, like in the sample I gave you, just give the basic bullet points and the interpretations. And that's what I'm looking for in this case. And, and as we've been talking earlier, uh, um, if, you're, if you're having a difficult time gathering industry data, part of the case is to use, to work around that. Take the competitor company, take a 12-month analysis and divide it by quarters or whatever. If I'm looking for the student to kind of adapt to the situation of using a quarterly statement to do this analysis. Yes, Mark. Nope. Uh, um, I'm, I'm okay. okay. I didn't have a question. No, no, I got a question for you guys. Totally, un well, it's somewhat financial related. I don't know if any of you are avid goers of the sport of Kings horse racing, but the Preakness is this afternoon, which I happen to be a, a, a player in the, uh, and a little bit of a gambling. And uh, I need maybe some advice on what horse to pick in the Preakness States Stakes, which is the second race of the Triple Crown of horse racing for three-year-olds. Can anybody give me a recommendation on what horse to pick for the Preakness, which is coming up in about an hour, hour and a half? Anybody? Yeah, I thought so. You're not, you're holding out on me. You're not telling me. But I was just curious. I'm, I'm right now. I'm leaning towards National Treasure as my horse to win it, which is a Bob Baffert horse. If anybody here knows what I'm talking about, uh, what is your pick for the Preakness Stakes this afternoon in the Triple Crown, Crown Series of horse racing? You know, if you help me pick the right horse. I can, uh, you know, that might give you some extra credit points. No, I'm just teasing. That well, might give you some extra credit But that's completely not my domain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I probably, that, I, I was in a, uh, I went to a, a graduation ceremony on campus today at Laverne. And I was before the ceremony, I was talking to some faculty members, just shooting the breeze before we had to go to the ceremony. I'm going, hey, who do you guys like in the Preakness? And they gave me a look like, what the hell are you talking about? Preakness, what is that? Horse racing, race. 
no clue. So uh, I, I've already had that today, Yunan. So don't worry about that. Okay, good luck with that. That's what I can do. Is wish you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Best of I'll, luck. <laughs> I'll need all the luck I can get. Trust me. I didn't do very good on the Kentucky Derby. So I, yeah. Okay. Professor, I have another question as well. Yes, Shabby. Uh, okay. Uh, in this field, I mean, uh, the course that we are studying uh, this semester was uh, really interesting to me. And I wonder if we can uh, work out uh, in real with some firms uh, to be more experienced in this field, you know what I mean? Uh, is uh, there any way to do that? Explain one more time. You may, in other words, do what we're doing in this class with in the real world yes, with companies. I mean, I, yes, I mean, I mean, in uh, for financial uh, analysis, uh, how we can work out more and experience more in real world. You know, ah. you know what I mean? Well, we're that's that's a great question. I wish we could do more of it. In the in the MBA program, you know, you all have to take a certain amount of core courses, as you all know, and foundation courses. And unless you're in the finance concentration of MBA work, your analytical or a class that, that we're doing things like in this class are rather limited unless you're actually in the finance concentration. Then you can take entrepreneurial finance. You can take uh, um, uh, a market, stock market or stock market research analysis or investment analysis. You can go to the next step and do that in the, for a real world analysis. But if you're not in the finance concentration, it pretty well ends in this class. Uh, as far as applying real world techniques and analysis to financial decision making. So, uh, and that can be frustrating for some students, but I, the students who are really into this shabby, uh, usually most of them are finance concentration MBA students. So then they are allowed to take two or three additional courses, which you can work with this in the real world. Now, it also depends on the professor you have and how the professor wants to go about that. But I know I have taught a couple of those classes and I just take this information or financial analytical information that you review and study in this core or foundation course and then apply it for even more detail and more analysis like in the entrepreneur course. In the entrepreneur course, we actually go out and value uh, uh, companies. So, uh, like not, not privately funded companies, like what's their actual value in the real world? We actually do those calculations doing free cash flow, financial statement analysis, beta analysis. Ooh, it's really, uh, it gets quite involved. But those additional classes would be available to a student to do this if a finance concentration. But if you're non-finance, it's like if you're marketing or even accounting or just taking a basic MBA, Though that's limited, and this is pretty well where it ends. So uh, I understand that, but uh, those are available. But it's 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 in a particular part of the MBA study that you can get that real world additional work on. Did I answer your question? Uh, actually, um, my concentration is uh, supply chain management. But, oh, uh, I know, as far as I know, there is some optional courses that we can uh, yeah. pick from other concentrations. Okay. But do you think actually it looks uh, working in every field? But as you mentioned, it it seems that uh, it doesn't work uh, if we have another concentration. Yeah, right? and also a lot of the especially if you're in supply chain or any other concentration besides finance, the finance additional finance MBA courses are not available on a regular basis. Like they offer the entrepreneur class once a year. So if you don't, if it doesn't come on that one fall two session, you miss it. You got to wait another year to get that class. And the same thing holds true with investment analysis and other things. So those courses are only offered like once a year, uh, which makes it difficult for other students to kind of get into those classes. But, you know, another thing to shabby to, to you work on, and I encourage students in the MBA program who are into this, is especially if you're working with a company, uh, a especially a, a public company that has stock and financial statement, is do some of this work on your company, on your specific company. Uh, maybe uh, do an, a financial analysis of your specific company. Maybe do a risk analysis of this company using this information. One of the good things about this course is that I leave the Blackboard open until 2025. 
So if you go on and take additional courses or you go on and, and want to do this in, in other ways, you, can, you have access to this data. Also, our, U, our playlist on YouTube is available for you forever. So you can go back and look at some of these videos or some of this analysis if you want to apply it to your own professional work at your company. Or, you know, I've had students use a lot of this data because they're thinking about starting a business and they go out and you put together a business plan and you can you crunch these numbers for a business plan doing a capital budget analysis. So you, there, this information is available to you if you can't not you find it in a course or want to go out on your own in your own uh, a specific way, you can do this. And I've had a lot of students continue on with this analysis and this in this real world application with the companies they're working with. Or, or, or let's say you want to start a stock portfolio. Before you pick those stocks, you want to do a complete analysis about, uh, about the companies that you're thinking about investing in. This will definitely help you do that analysis. Thank you, sir. Okay. I, I really appreciate that you, uh, uh, I mean, open the access to the information. That's really yes. appreciate. Yes, that, that's good. Because I, really, if you're in a class or have taken a class or will take a class in the MBA and the professor is not making their d information available to you after you leave the class, ask the professor, hey, dude, I want to keep working on this. It, it's intrigued me. Could you please make this available? down into the future so I have access to it and they will do that for you. Good information, Mr. Hathi. Okay, Yonan, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm in the finance concentrated uh, program right now with MBA and I'm wondering if you have any other classes you're teaching in the summer or in the fall, the fall semester actually, because I really- uh, Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, my summer schedule is all set, you know, and I'm teaching this class online this summer, the 630 class online this summer. I'm teaching a, a, the business undergraduate finance class this summer, and I'm teaching an accounting class for MBA students this summer. And I, many of you uh, have already had that class, or in, I think in the case of Mark, he had it with me last session, that accounting class. So uh, that's my schedule now. Now, the schedule for the fall has not been set yet, will be set probably in July. And the reason for that is, is we're waiting to see the enrollment numbers. And I, know, I don't know if any of you know what's going on, but a lot of MBA programs are really challenged these days because of dropping enrollments. Dropping enrollments for a lot of reasons. One, it's expensive. Two, it's uh, it's difficult for students to uh, get back into the graduate study, especially after the pandemic. They want to see what their career is going to look like, or what their time management is, and if they have the money, if they're if the if their employer is not going to pay for it. a lot of reasons. So our enrollments are down about 20, 25 percent in our MBA program. So that's challenging the amount of courses and the availability of professors going forward. Now I usually teach the entrepreneur or the investment analysis class in in the uh, in the fall of every year, the fall session. But as of now, I, I do not have those classes because we're waiting to see what the enrollment and also there's another faculty member ahead of me with a little bit more seniority and he will probably get those classes if they're available. So the next possible opportunity to maybe have me in those sh finance concentration classes going on probably won't be until the spring of next year, which is sad to say, mm -hmm. but that's the way it is. Okay, I will keep an eye. <laughs> keep an keep an eye out. You never know what happens. Okay, and my plan is to graduate at the end of the year. If good, good. That, that's that's fair. Don't wait for me. Graduate, get the hell out of here, and keep on going. That's right. Okay. That's, okay. Thank you. Hey, Professor Hattie, uh yes, will Mark. you be there in person to watch the race? Or are you doing it from? No, the the now? race. The, I might, matter of fact, I'm watching the race right now on another computer. Oh. Haha. It's in it's in nice. Maryland. The race is in Baltimore, <laughs> Maryland. So I right. wish I could be there, but I think I'd rather I think your students would rather have me around this weekend to do this stuff. So no, I am uh, I am not I wish I was at the race, but when I officially, officially, officially retire, I that's on my bucket list is to go to all three races of the Triple Crown live one year. They're in Kentucky. They're in Baltimore, and the third one is in New York at Belmont on Long Island. That's one of my nice. bucket list to do that when I officially retire and get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be fun. It will be fun. It'll be expensive, but it'll be fun. <laughs> uh, 
Well, that's why you're setting up for that for that dream of yours. That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I got a lot of bucket items still to take care of before I call it quits. <laughs> right on. Well, thanks a lot for all of your help. Sure. And I'm, you know, it doesn't end here. We're still going to be around in the next week. And um, I think if uh, Jose or uh, Yonan or Shabby, if you don't have anything, I think I'll, we're, we're out about an hour. I think that's good enough time, especially for people who want to review this. Uh, instead of hearing me talk about the Preakness, they want to get the information about our cases. So I think I think I'm, I'll cut it off now, if that's all right with you guys, and we'll end it. And I'll post this in the next hour to Blackboard in case you want to refer to it again. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Yep. I'm okay, good. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a nice and I'll, weekend. I'll see you on, on online on Monday. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Adios. Adios. There it is.